get started, everyone. Uh, welcome to the algorithm session. Um, I, let's get started with the first talk. So I'm going to hand the floor to Michael Wren, who's going to talk about circular trace reconstruction. Go ahead, okay. Michael. Thanks. Yeah, so um, this was joint work with Sham Narayanan. So uh, I'm just going to be giving an overview of our uh, results, the problem we're working on and like future directions for um, the problem. So um, first I want to um, briefly talk about trace reconstruction in, for linear strings, um, which is the variant that people have worked on before. So the setup is that uh, we have some unknown binary string X of some given length N. It's going to be passed through a deletion channel in which every bit is going to be independently deleted with some fixed probability Q. And then the resulting bits that remain are gonna be concatenated into a shorter string called a trace. Uh, so the question is, can we construct, figure out what the original string was uh, from looking at a lot of traces and how many traces do we need to do this to be able to do it uh, with high probability? So uh, as an example, uh, let's say we have uh, this string here. Um, and you can think of the uh, Q as around like a half. So like half the bits will be deleted. And then, so it's gonna be passed through the channel and the red bits will be deleted. So, oh. Um. Okay, uh, so the red bits will be deleted. And then so the remaining bits are concatenated and the string we see after um, it's passed through the channel is 110110. So we wanna see like, if we get a lot of these traces, can we figure out what the original string was? Uh, so the motivation for studying this comes uh, originally from some problems in computational biology about DNA. So we can think of like the strings as uh, a sequence of DNA. So like there's the multiple sequence alignment problem where we want to figure out what the DNA sequence of an ancestor looks like if we can sequence the descendants. Uh, there's also uh, DNA storage where we can store data in DNA and we can recover it through sequencing, but reading the data is kind of noisy. And uh, for example, um, bits can be uh, randomly deleted when we read it. Uh, so some previous results in trace reconstruction for linear strings. So there's a few different variants that people work on. Uh, so in the worst case, we want to be able to reconstruct any arbitrary string X of length N with high probability. Um, so, in this case, Holenstein et al. showed that uh, this can be done in um, e to the root n up to log factors in the exponent traces. Uh, this is improved simultaneously by Nazarov Perez and De O'Donnell Cervadio to e to the cube root of n. And very recently, uh, Chase improved this to e to the fifth root of n up to log factors. Uh, another variant um, is average case reconstruction where the string x is um, chosen randomly from all length and strings. So uh, this is um, different and easier because for example, if there's some string that is very hard for us to figure out in the worst case, in the average case, it's very unlikely to occur. Uh, so Holenstein et al showed that if the deletion probability is low enough, then we can do it in polynomially many traces. This was improved to uh, each of the root log n for uh, deletion probabilities less than a half by Perez and Jai, um, which was then improved by Holden, Pimentel and Perez to e to the cube root of log n for any constant deletion probability. There's also the question of lower bounds. So like, how can, uh, can we prove any lower bounds for those two questions? And uh, Holden and Leon showed um, a lower bound of n to the 5 fourth up to log factors for worst case, and roughly log n to the 9 fourths for average case, which was improved by chase to n to the 3 halves and log n to the 5 halves. So um, the variant we introduced circular trace reconstruction is very similar, except now the strings are going to be cyclic strings or circular strings. It's still going to be passed through a deletion channel. Um, every bit's gonna be deleted with independently with probability Q. The bits are gonna be concatenated into a shorter circular string. And we want to reconstruct what the original string is uh, up to cyclic rotation. So equivalently, we can think of this as um, a linear string, except it's going to undergo a random cyclic rotation before it goes through the deletion channel. So the motivation for studying this is that uh, certain types of DNA are circular. So if we want to think about those applications before, for those types of DNA, we should think about circular trace reconstruction. Uh, 
Uh, so here's an example. We have a length 12 circular string. It's going to be passed through the deletion channel. The red bits are going to be deleted. Uh, the remaining bits are going to be concatenated together into a shorter circular string. And we can read it as a linear string by picking an arbitrary uh, bit in the circle to start with. So the question is, um, can we get similar bounds on the sample complexity uh, for the circular case compared to the linear case? Um, so uh, we have results in the three areas I talked about before. So first, for worst case reconstruction, um, we have some arbitrary, we want to reconstruct arbitrary circular strings X. It's going to be of length N going through a deletion channel of probability Q. So um, our result is that if N is the product of at most two primes, then um, we can recover X with um, E to the uh, cube root of N traces up to log factors in the exponent. Uh, so the reason that uh, there's this dependence on the prime factorization of N is that in our proof, which um, so we modify the approach for linear strings um, where we want to consider a certain polynomial that, um, that um, has coefficients depending on the string, um, except to deal with the circular strings, um, we need to incorporate, like we need to encode the circular nature of the string somehow. So we use nth roots of unity. And if n has too many prime factors, then the nth roots of unity aren't as well behaved and our approach doesn't work. So in fact, we've shown that the only n for which our approach works um, are exactly the n which are the product of at most two primes. Uh, for average case reconstruction, uh, so in this case, the circular string is some random circular string. Um, we've shown that uh, we can reconstruct it with polynomially many traces where the x coordinate is going to depend on the, uh, what the, the deletion probability and it will tend to infinity as the deletion probability tends to one. Finally, for uh, the lower bound, we have, um, we've shown that up to log factors, we need at least n cubed independent traces for the worst case um, compared to the n to the three halves for that is known for the linear strings. So um, there's a lot of future directions that um, this can be taken in. So uh, first, um, so this work was completed before Chase um, released his result about um, e to the fifth root of n. So the question is, can we match this even for say n prime? And um, regarding that, um, there's a question of if, if we can remove the dependency on the prime factorization of n in our upper bound. Um, and also whether um, we can sort of match linear strings and get a sub polynomial for the average case. Uh, so the difficulty here is that um, most of the previous work for the average case where a sub polynomial bound was obtained um, sort of tries to reconstruct the string from beginning to end. So uh, the difficulty for circular strings is that there is no beginning to the string. And uh, it seems difficult to align the string so that we can consider a beginning. Um, there's also the question of if we can improve the lower bound for the worst case, um, maybe to a super polynomial bound since um, it's, it seems easier to get, uh, we can get like better bounds for this compared to the linear string case. Uh, finally, um, can we get better bounds if the deletion probability tends to zero as n goes to infinity? So like non-constant deletion. And I think there's actually a talk later in the session regarding this. Uh, okay, that's it. Thanks for listening to the talk. Thank you, much applause. Um, we're going to save questions for the end of the session. Um, if you have questions for the authors, please you know, write them down to remember them because it will be you know, half an hour from now. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over to Nathan Hu, I think. Are you the presenter? For sampling arborescences in parallel. Yeah. Is audio and everything working? Yeah, working great if you want to do your screen share. All right, so let me give the floor over to Nathan, who will talk about sampling arborescences in parallel. Okay, okay so hi everyone, I'm Nathan. I'm a sophomore in, at Stanford, and here's some joint work with Nima, Amin, and Aaron on sampling arborescences in parallel. Oops. Okay, so our story sort of begins by asking like the most basic questions we can in CS when it comes to given a graph and some structure on the graph. So, you know, the sort of level zero question one might ask is, you know, so let's say we're caring about spanning trees, right? The easiest question we can ask is, does this graph contain a spanning tree and can we find it? 
And then two of the sort of slightly harder, but still really important questions you can ask are, can we count how many spanning trees there are? And can we randomly sample one? And it turns out for a large class of problems and structures, these two questions of sampling and counting are equivalent up to a polynomial time reduction. But the story gets a little bit more messy when we look to restrict the computation um, beyond just sequential algorithms. So specifically, where we're looking at this sort of world of parallel algorithms where we're in a PRAM model with these processors interacting via some shared random access memory. And now, just as um, polynomial time was the gold standard for sequential algorithms, we can define something known as NC or Nix class, where um, the total work is still polynomial, but it's heavily parallelizable up to being left with just a polylog runtime. And now the story and this equivalence gets a lot more messy. So returning back to this idea of sort of sampling and counting, there are all these structures for whom counting can be done by taking some determinants of matrices. And in general, all this linear algebra is very, very parallelizable. Thus, for all these structures, we have exact counting in parallel. But um, for all these structures, sampling is pretty much open for efficient parallel sampling algorithms. And so this is like a very vast disparity in contrast to the equivalence in sequential algorithms. And our work is sort of tackling this gap from one specific object. And we're, what we're looking at is arborescences, which are this generalization of spanning trees to directed graphs. So now you see that the edges um, still form a spanning tree and they're oriented such that aside from a root vertex, every vertex has one incoming edge. And these are one such structure for whom exact counting can be doable by taking a few determinants. And we show that there's an efficient parallel algorithm to sample our resonances from weighted directed graphs. And we sample our resonances according to this probability distribution proportional to the edge weights. And we have a couple of basic building blocks we use um, in our algorithm. So the first is this theorem by Aldous and Broder, which tells us that this task of sampling can be reduced to simulating a random walk and recording the first visit edges to recording every edge that visits an unvisited vertex. And by doing this um, and just extracting all sorts of visit edges, we are left with an arborescence that's distributed how we want. And you know this has been used for um, very fast sequential sampling algorithms for spanning trees, but it's slightly less obvious why this helps us since um, random walks are also this very inherently sequential process. But here comes in our sort of second building block, which is work by Tang. And what he showed is that and um, we can actually very efficiently simulate these random walks in parallel. So we can generate this polynomially long transcript in um, NC. And so the key intuition or idea behind Tang's idea, Tang's work is that we can do this classic divide and conquer strategy of simulating the first half of our random walk and the second half of our random walk in parallel before aggregating everything together. And while we can't really simulate the second half of our random walk without knowing the starting vertex, we can sort of be brute force about this and leverage polynomial memory processors to simulate every possible second half of our random walk before aggregating everything together. And so putting together Tang sort of parallel random walk techniques with um, Aldous Broder already solves this sampling problem when um, our graph has a cover time, which is polynomial. Because then we can generate this polynomially long transcript and with very high probability, we'll have all first versus edges, which we can extract. But um, very few graphs actually um, have these guarantees of polynomial cover time. Um, this is only guaranteed for unweighted graphs and there are examples of weighted graphs and directed graphs for whom we have exponentially large cover times. So we need a third sort of key building block, which is shortcutting to remove this obstacle. And the sort of main idea behind sort of shortcutting is that for Alice Broder's theorem, when we simulate our random walk, we only care about the edges which visit unvisited vertices. So that means a large part of our random walk is not important to simulate and we can ignore it. So concretely, imagine we're doing some random walk that's currently bouncing between vertices D and E. Um, after vertices D and E have both been hit, we really don't care about our random walk until we finally exit this cluster. And thus we just want to you know, sort of fast forward our random walk until saying, when we finally leave, do we leave through edge um, DB or EDC? And it turns out that in general, given some vertex set on a graph, and a current location, um, the, all these out, if we want to just ask the question of when our random walk finally leaves this cluster of vertices, what edge do we take? Those probabilities can be computed very efficiently in parallel. And um, this means that we can essentially sort of very efficiently fast forward our walk if we know what sort of clusters we wish to ignore. And so combining all these techniques together, I'm gonna to go into a sort of high level overview of our algorithm. And so we begin by doing some pre-processing on our graph. And this is going to um, ensure sort of like all the fine print on the Aldous Broder slide is fulfilled and also ensure that our graph is finally Eulerian. And this Eulerian property and the fact that Eulerian graphs can be decomposed into cycles will be really important for, to allow us to sort of 
divide our graph into these clusters where intuitively each cluster um, is tightly connected by edges such that a random walk spends a lot of time sort of bouncing around within each cluster before leaving. So these clusters are kind of the ideal target for us to leverage the shortcutting insight from a few slides ago. And then we sort of keep on recursively dividing these clusters into um, smaller and smaller subsets of vertices such that each cluster can be divided into smaller clusters that also sort of uh, waste a lot of time in our random walk until we're left with just leaves as vertices. And then if you realize that um, because from our shortcutting slide, given any cluster in a current location, we can very quickly simulate the directly simulate these outgoing edges. What this means is that we can generate these transcripts of um, sort of jumping edges, where now instead of being the canonical um, random walk that looks like a sequence of edge vertex, edge vertex, we have intermediate states of vertices. So for example, so these transcripts sort of correspond to random walks simulated up to the resolution of some subset of vertices. So with this concrete interpretation of we're bouncing around in some cluster before exiting our cluster through some edge and then bouncing around a new cluster before exiting through a subsequent edge. And we can simulate these random walks on every single cluster. Um, um, so for the smaller clusters, we can do this while conditioning on both an outgoing edge and a starting vertex. So then the key insight to note is that while we do all the sim simulation in parallel, these intermediate states, which again represent this kind of unsimulated random walk on a cluster with a conditioned outgoing vertex, are exactly what we were already simulating in parallel at, during this time step. And what this allows us to do is sort of stitch all these transcripts together until we're left with this final transcript of I guess a mixture of vertices and edges such that for each cluster we have sort of polynomially many edges which jump between those children. So this final transcript sort of corresponds to a random walk which with a lot of parts already omitted and quick, done quickly. And um, for some polynomial um, we can generate this transcript very quickly and efficiently in parallel. So then lastly we can extract all the sort of first visit edges from such a transcript and you know, with very, and very hopefully, you know, this will in fact give us an arborescence. So aside from our algorithm, the last, um, I guess, ingredient needed in our result is analysis of random walks on directed graphs, which allow us to, um, which kind of coupled with how we did perform our decomposition and finding found these clusters, tell us that for some polynomial length, each of these, um, um, this transcript that has the mixture of jumping edges along each cluster will in fact contain all sort of first visit edges with high probability and thus we'll very likely be able to walk away with a randomly sampled arborescence and be happy. And so as a recap, um, we've done all this work to produce a very efficient parallel sampling algorithm for arborescences. And this is sort of a first um, step in bridging this big divide between parallel sampling and parallel counting algorithms. And this big divide naturally leads to a lot of open questions when it comes to structures and asking, do these structures have efficient algorithms for sampling in parallel? And so two of these structures, which are very closely related to arborescences, are Eulerian tours and regular matroids. And then more generally, we can um, look to achieve a quick parallel sampling algorithms through something known as Bolson's algorithm, which is this random walk-based cousin of Aldous and Broder, which also has generalizations to higher dimensional matroids. And most generally, that big list of combinatorial objects all have sort of very efficient counting algorithms, but have open parallel sampling problems. So with that, um, thank you all. And I guess we'll push questions to the end. Thank you, Nathan. Let's get some silent applause. Uh, if we could go ahead and switch over, I think, to Jin Ho Lee, is that right? Who will be Thanks, giving sir. the next talk? Awesome. Um, so yeah, we have we have your audio and we have your slides. So uh, the floor is yours, Chin Ho, to talk about polynomial time trace reconstruction in the low deletion rate regime. Okay, hello everyone. So this is a joint work with Li Chen and the other Rockles a video and Sandeep Singh. So in case you missed the first talk, let me tell you what is the trace reconstruction problem. So in this problem, there is a deletion channel that acts on a string X. So what it does is that it first deletes each bit of x independently with some probability delta, and then it will output uh, the concatenation of the surviving bits. So let me give you some examples here. So for example, this is our x, and then if we pass it to the deletion channel, then it may delete maybe the second bit or the fifth bit of x, and then it outputs the concatenation of these surviving bits, which is in this case, uh, 11101. 
and then maybe the next time it is the first bit and the second last bit, and then the concatenation of these surviving bits will be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So finally, maybe this time it only is the third bit. So this time you get a so this time you get a longer output string. So note that as you can see here, the outputs in outputs you don't know the deleted positions, and also the length of the outputs uh, are not always the same. Okay, so we call these independent samples coming from the deletion channel the traces. So what's the trace reconstruction problem? So the problem is that you are given some um, unknown, so you are given some traces of an unknown MP string X. So you only get to see the right-hand side here. And then the goal is to reconstruct X exactly with high probability over the deletion channel. So one, uh, one question is uh, to study is how many traces are sufficient to recover X? And then uh, if so, what are they as an efficient algorithm to achieve this task? So just to give you some motivation, this problem has some applications in computational biology where the traces correspond to some mutated sequence. And then, so you're given some mutated DNA sequences and then you want to reconstruct the original DNA sequence from this mutated one. So let me quickly talk about some previous results. So this problem was introduced by Batu, Kenan, Kana, and McGregor in 2004. So in that paper, they give an efficient algorithm for deletion rate that is less than one over square root of n. And then subsequently, we have this uh, recent work that, for example, Dale O'Donnell, Servideo, and Nasarov and Paris independently show that for any constant deletion rate, uh, there is an algorithm that uses exponential to enter one third samples in time. And this was uh, very recently improved uh, to, so this exponent was improved to one fifth by Chase recently. So in terms of lower bound, this original work by uh, BT, BKKM, they show that for any deletion rate delta, you need uh, roughly delta n samples. And then in another work by Chase, built on that builds on the work of Holden and I and say, he, so that for any constant deletion rate, you need uh, some polynomial number of samples. So you can see that all these recent work have been focusing on improving the sampling complexity and the runtime for constant deletion rate. So they are essentially they are less practical than the BKKM algorithm, which runs in polynomial time. So here in this work, we ask the following question. Suppose we insist on the algorithm being efficient then what is the largest deletion rate that we can handle? So here is our result. We showed that for any constant epsilon and deletion rate delta that's less than one over n to the one third plus epsilon, there is an efficient algorithm that recovers x with high probability. Okay. So this work improves the exponent of uh, one half in this work by BKKM to one third in terms of deletion rates that you can handle. So maybe you may think that this improvement may not be um, too much, but then notes that when the deletion rate is say one over uh, square root of n, then actually the previous best upper bound uses exponential n to one six uh, traces. And uh, we believe our approach could actually work for larger deletion rates delta, say one over poly n deletion rate. So let me talk about our algorithm. So our approach is similar to the one given by BKKM, which is also a alignment-based approach. So before I tell you the algorithms, I have to introduce a notion called dashers. So uh, S dashers is just a long repeated pattern of constant size. So how long is uh, roughly one of a delta bits long? So for example, if this is our unknown string X, then if you have at least one over delta many uh, consecutive ones, then this is a one desert. Uh, here you have a zero one desert because you have many zero one zero one zero zero one zero one, and it has uh, is of length at least one over delta. So here is our algorithm. So our algorithm alternates between two procedures. One is called a bitwise majority alignment. Short in short is called BMA. So it will reconstruct X up to a few bits of the desert. Uh, 
And then the next procedure will be to find the end of this desert and then align this point to some new traces. So let me uh, give you an example. So for example, this is our unknown X in gray. And then at the beginning, we draw some traces, okay? And then we run our BMA algorithm on these traces. This algorithm will give us a candidate uh, X hat. So X hat may not uh, completely agree with X, but we know what it guarantees is that it's correct with high probability up to the first M bits of the desert, of the first desert. So we know that these prefix of X are, are correct. And we know that uh, there is a desert at the end of uh, the reconstructed prefix. So now the goal will be to find the end point of this desert. So we run our next procedure, find end. So what it does is that it will locate this endpoint in X. So now you know this is the endpoint and you know the pattern, so you can fill out the, the rest of the bits here. Okay. And then you will also draw some new traces and then you align uh, this endpoint of the desert to these new traces. So you know that uh, these arrows are pointing to uh, where this uh, endpoint is in the X. So now you align the traces so you can re just again alternate, you switch to BMA and continue running this algorithm. So you reconstruct uh, the rest of the X again. Now this may not completely agree with X because it may contain a desert but you know that it's correct up to the first M bits of the next desert. So you switch to find end, find the end of the desert, and then um, fill out the, this pattern, draw some new traces, and then align uh, these endpoints to these new traces. And then you continue running uh, this algorithm using the same principles. So here you run BMA again, and now because there's no more deserts in X, so you know that uh, the algorithm uh, just terminates and then you know that this X hat is gonna be correct with high probability. So I won't be have time to tell you the details of the analysis. So let me just summarize. So here is a summary. We show that for any constant epsilon and addition rate delta that is at most one over n to the one third plus epsilon, there's an efficient algorithm that we call this X or with high probability using polynomial number of samples and a running time. And our algorithm alternate, alternates between two procedure. One is a BMA and then the other is fine end. So uh, one bottleneck is that our analysis for fine end requires this uh, square root of N delta to be less than one over delta. Now, if you work out uh, this uh, inequality, you will notice delta is at most one over N to the one third. And then this is the reason uh, why our algorithm only works for one over n to the one third plus epsilon. So uh, one uh, natural open question is whether you can use this kind of approach to give an efficient algorithm for deletion rate, say one over n to the three, 0 0.32, or more generally whether it works for say one over n to the epsilon for any constant epsilon. So this is all I wanted to say about this work. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Jin Ho. So I'll give live applause. Everyone else can give silent applause. Uh, if we can go ahead and switch over to the next speaker, who I think is Mike Sinkowski. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name right. Uh, uh, yeah, Sinkowski. But awesome. Uh, so if you could go ahead and screen share, and I'll remind all the participants that I hope you're um, writing down and saving your questions. We will have panel slash question time at the end here. And also I'll remind you that you can communicate with the authors via Slack if you like, each of these papers has its own Slack channel. Uh, so let's give the floor over to Mike who will tell us about a new connection between node and edge depth robust graphs. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, so I'm Mike Sinkowski. I'm gonna talk about a new connection between node and edge depth robust graphs. Um, and this is joint work with Jeremiah Blackie. So a depth robust graph is a directed acyclic graph that has certain properties, um, which I'll define on the next slide. Um, and the main reason we're interested in depth robust graphs is they have multiple applications to cryptography. Um, for example, depth robust graphs are used to create secure data independent memory hard functions, uh, which are used um, in password hashing. 
Um, additionally, they have applications to blockchain. Um, so for creating proofs of space and proofs of sequential work. Um, so these are sort of the motivating applications for studying depth of bus graphs. Um, so now I'll kind of uh, go into the formal definitions. Um, and first I'll um, introduce a the negated definition because it's a bit easier to illustrate. Um, so we say that a, um, a DAG G is ED node reducible. If there's some set of vertices of size at most E, such that when you remove that set from the graph, the depth of the graph is at most E. And here, um, depth is defined to be the number of edges in the longest path. And then we say that G is ED node depth or bust um, if it's not ED node reducible. Um, so here we have this example um, DAG on five vertices. If we just remove one node, um, we see that the remaining graph has depth at most two. Um, so we call it one, two, node reducible. And similarly, if we can re we remove any node, um, we see that the depth is always greater than D or greater than one. So we call it one, one, node depth or bus. Um, and similarly, we can define edge depth or bus graphs um, where we remove edges instead of nodes. So here, again, we have the same graph. If we just remove one edge, um, we reduce the um, depth to be at most three. Um, so we call it one, three edge reducible. And this graph will be um, one, two edge reducible because if you remove any one edge, the depth is always greater than two. Um, so the reason we're interested in you know, sort of comparing node and edge depth of bus graphs is they're basically all the applications I talked about earlier require node depth of bus graphs. Um, so memory hard functions, proof of space. But um, we think that edge depth of bus graphs are potentially easier to construct. Um, so if you think about removing an edge from a graph it doesn't affect the graph as much as removing a node and then removing all the edges incident to it. Um, and so we have these two um, kind of example constructions that are well known in the literature. So the Grace construction is an edge depth of bus graph that has a very simple construction and analysis. Um, but this graph, the EGS graph, is a no depth of bus graph um, that has a very complicated construction and analysis. So what we'd like are new techniques for constructing no depth of bus graphs. Um, and I should note that most of our known constructions of depth of bus graphs are some sort of variant on the EGS graph. Um, so we'd like some sort of new way of constructing no depth of bus graphs. And so our main result is that um, we come up with a transformation. So we transform an ED edge depth of bus graph that has M edges into an E over two, the no depth of bus graph um, that will have constant in degree and order M and vertices. Um, and so if we apply our transformation directly to the, um, if we apply our transformation directly to grates, we get a no depth of bus graph that has these certain parameters. Um, the exact ones aren't necessarily important, but the, what you should take away is that this is an improvement on prior constructions um, for intermediate I values. Um, additionally, um, this makes progress towards resolving an open problem about the pebbling complexity of data independent memory hard functions. And so um, to create this transformation, um, we introduce and define graphs that we call S tier bus graphs. That'll be sort of our key technical ingredient in the transformation. And uh, these S tier bus graphs have uh, additional applications to proof of space and what we call source to sync depth of bus graphs. Um, so the high level of our transformation is we take a highly edge depth of bus graph and then replace each node of the graph with an S tier bus graph. And then the resulting graph then will have constant in degree and be highly node depth or bus. Um, so a question that I'll spend the rest of the talk answering is what properties should this S tier bus graph have? Um, another question you could ask is, can we actually construct these graphs? And um, the answer is yes, um, but it's in our paper. Um, so the key building block we have is um, what we call maximal S tier bus graphs. So we have some DAG here um, on the left um, that has N inputs and N outputs. And so for all, um, k less than or equal to n, we can remove any k nodes from this graph. And then there'll be some subgraph of this that has at least n minus k inputs and n minus k outputs, um, such that each input connects to every single output. Um, so for each input on the left, there's some path that can reach um, all of these n minus k outputs. Um, and one of the main results from our paper is we construct um, a family of linear sized, constant and degree, maximal S tier bus graphs. And so here's an example for n equals three. 
Um, if we remove any one node from this graph, there's some subgraph that has two inputs and two outputs. Um, each input connects to every output. Similarly, if we remove any two nodes from this graph, then there's a, some subgraph that has one input and one output, and they're connected. Um, so to kind of return to what our transformation is, so we have some directed acyclic graph, and then we will um, basically swap in for each node um, as a S tier bus graph. And um, the size of the graph will depend on the maximum in and out degree. And uh, we sort of just randomly assign each input um, to an input of the S tier bus graph and same for the outputs. Um, and so to kind of talk about um, why we want this S tier bus property, um, we'll kind of just zoom in on one node here, say it has three incoming edges and two outgoing edges. Um, so if we just remove one node from this graph, then um, by the S tier busness property, um, there'll be some subgraph that has two of the inputs and two of the outputs. And each one of the inputs um, can connect to each to all of the outputs. Um, and so what this corresponds to is um, sort of like saying we remove the two edges that are no longer covered by the S tier busness property. So um, if we have our transform graph and we remove um, E over two vertices, then that corresponds to um, some set of E edges. And that, those, that set of edges is what we um, say remove the original graph. And since it's edge depth robust, we will get a um, path of length D. And because of the uh, connective property, that each input can connect each output in the S tier bus graphs, we can uh, map a path from the original graph um, back into our transform graph. Um, and just to summarize, um, so we have this new transformation from edge depth of bus graphs to node depth of bus graphs that improves um, our constructions for certain parameters. Um, and to do that, we define and constructed S tier bus graphs. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about them in this talk, but they have S tier bus graphs have sort of independent applications to proof of space and uh, source to sync depth of bus graphs. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have one last talk. So if we could go ahead and switch over, I think to Joshua Lau, um, who must be winning some kind of time zone award because I think he's coming to us all the way from Sydney. Uh, so Joshua, the floor is yours to talk about algorithms and hardness for multidimensional range updates and queries. Go ahead. Awesome, uh, thanks Sam. So uh, I'm Joshua Lau, I'll be talking about algorithms and hardness for multidimensional range updates and queries. Uh, this is a joint work with Angus Ratosa. So, okay, so let's say you have an array, a two-dimensional array that's initially uh, all zero. So it's an array of integers, it's all zeros. Uh, we're gonna design some sort of data structure that can perform range updates and range queries to this uh, array. So some examples of this, let's say we want to add some constant to some range of cells in the array. So we might add six to these cells. We might add two to these cells forming this new array. Uh, and we also want to support range queries. So for instance, we might select a range. In, in this case, all our ranges are orthogonal ranges. Uh, we select a range and we ask for its sum. So in this case, the sum of this range is 66. We're also interested in uh, different sorts of updates. So for instance, more complex updates might provide a constant along with the range. And we replace each of the elements in that range with the maximum of that constant and the, the cell's existing value. So as you can see here, before we had uh, two cells that, were, that had value two, they've now increased to seven, but our two cells that had value eight, uh, their value has stayed the same. And after performing such updates, we will ask, we'll also support range queries, which uh, ask for the sum of values in a particular range. So in this case, this is 54. So we can define a class of problems, or we do define a new class of problems formed by choosing some dimension, in this case, two dimensions, choosing a set of updates that we support, in this case, plus updates, we call them, and max updates, uh, as well as a query. So in this case, our query operation is sum. And different sorts of problems can be formed in this way. And we're interested in the complexity of, of different sorts of these problems. 
uh, for simplicity and for the purpose of this talk, uh, we'll just focus on this particular variant. So plus updates, max updates, and some queries. So when we consider problems of this kind, we're going to measure complexity in terms of uh, the number n of operations. So we start with a, an arbitrarily large grid or an arbitrarily large array, initially all zeros, and we just measure complexity in terms of the number of operations that are performed. And it's known that in one dimension, uh, we can perform for this particular problem all updates and queries in order n log squared n time. So an operation is either an update or a query. What's been mostly unexplored prior to this work is, well, how hard is this in two dimensions? How hard is this in, in, in higher dimensions? Things like that. So to answer this question and to also consider why we're actually interested in problems of this kind, uh, I'll give a reduction from three sum. So I'll show how the, the data structure I introduced at the start of the talk can be used to, to solve three sum efficiently if an efficient algorithm for this data structure exists. So the three sum problem, which you might be familiar with, gives us input uh, m integers. And it asks, well, are there three values, a, b, and c, within this set of integers, such that the sum of a and b is equal to c? And the three sum conjecture posits that this can't be done in truly subquadratic time. That is, for m integers, there's no order m to the 2 minus epsilon time solution for any positive epsilon. OK, so let's see how such a reduction works. Let's say our array A is just formed from the values 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. We start with our grid that's initially all zeros, as before. And from this array, we can form an addition table using our plus updates only. So we can add 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to each of our columns. And we can add 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to each of our rows. Now, at this stage, each cell of the array contains the sum of exactly two elements in A. Uh, we'll ignore double counting for now. Uh, we'll just, we'll, that's dealt with uh, in our paper, but for now, let's just ignore double counting. So each cell will contain a possible value of A plus B. So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through A and try each value of A as a possible value of C and see if that appears in the array. So for instance, let's say C is 4. We want to check if there is some 4 that appears somewhere in the grid. And that's equivalent or that's equivalent roughly to asking uh, how many 4s are in the grid. And we can write this as counting the number of elements that are at most 4 in the grid and subtracting off the number of elements that are at most 3 in the grid uh, because we're dealing with integers. So let's just fit focus on counting the number of elements that are at most four in the grid. To do that, we can use our max update. So from the grid that we had earlier, that addition table, we can maximize the entire grid uh, with four. Now, the values that have changed are those that were previously at most four, and that they're now gonna be exactly equal to four. We can do the same again uh, maximizing the whole grid with five. So what's changed now is that every value that was precisely four in the left grid has changed to five in the right grid. Another way of thinking about this is that the only elements that have changed from the left grid to the right grid are precisely those that were at most four in the original grid. So the sum of the right grid has increased exactly by the number of elements that were at most four in our original grid. So we can write the number of elements um, at most four uh, as below. OK, so that means that once we have our addition table set up in a constant number of updates and queries, that is operations, we can check if a particular element exists within the grid. Repeating this for all our m elements gives us a reduction that uses order m operations. And this implies that there's no truly subquadratic time algorithm uh, for this data structure problem when we measure complexity in terms of the number of operations n. Now, this is just one problem we consider in our work. Uh, we consider actually a, a C of other uh, different variations of, of our problem uh, by considering different sets of updates and queries. 
So over in the top right, we have this plus update, max update, sum query uh, variant that we considered. And we showed that under the three sum conjecture, uh, there's no truly subquadratic time algorithm for this. But under fine uh, under other fine grain conjectures, uh, we can also show various other lower bounds. So for instance, under the orthogonal vectors conjecture, uh, we can show that uh, both of these are hard, not just in two dimensions, but also in, uh, in D dimensions. And we know by just tessellating uh, one dimensional uh, one dimensional instances, uh, we can actually solve in the same time, uh, relative, reasonably naively, uh, the same problem for a whole range of different updates supported simultaneously. So this forms an, a nearly tight complexity class up the top. Then down below from prior work, we know that in roughly linear time, when the number of dimensions is constant, uh, we can support just these plus updates and some queries as well as max updates and max queries. So this forms a, another complexity class down the bottom. What gets interesting is somewhere in the middle. So in the middle, we have um, some single update, single query variants for which we've shown uh, conditional lower bounds, conditioned on the online matrix vector conjecture and the all pairs shortest path conjecture uh, for different problems. And we establish matching into the one and a half upper bounds uh, for, this, for these particular problems. So we also have some problems that we, for which we've uh, found truly subquadratic upper bounds, uh, but we don't know if there's a lower bound better than n to the 1.5. So interestingly, uh, for these two set update plus uh, some query problems, uh, for these two problems, we find we uh, give a reduction to, um, to range inversion counting, uh, which uh, can be solved with matrix multiplication. And so we, obtain truly some quadratic lower bounds there. Uh, and finally, uh, there are some variants for which we don't know more than this. So we have maybe some rough connections with some of the problems that we've already studied. Uh, and we're, and it's, it's not known to us whether or not there are a better upper bounds or better lower bounds. So we don't know which precisely which complexity class uh, it falls in. So we hope that uh, this class of data structures can inspire some future work, uh, perhaps you, being used as a primitive and more complex algorithms, or just for showing the, the hardness of other problems. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Pause from, from here. Um, great, so we have about 12 minutes left in the session. Um, and since we have a pretty disparate set of topics, uh, I'm not going to um, try too hard to get questions that uh, apply to all of the papers at once. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions to particular authors uh, now. And if, uh, if, you got, if folks want to think about it a little bit, I also have some questions to ask. But I will um, give a moment here to see if any hands go up, if there are questions folks would like to ask about any of these talks. So I have I have a question for the authors of the trace reconstruction papers um, that came earlier in this session. I wonder if um, any of the authors would take a stab at comparing the techniques in the papers. What are their strengths and weaknesses? We didn't. We, there were short talks. We didn't get to hear much about the techniques, but whether we could hear about just uh, how the papers compare on a on an ideas level. Michael, do you want to go first or can you? Uh, sure. So um, I guess one thing is that, um, so our paper didn't really address efficiency at all. So uh, we only looked at really the sample complexity and we didn't think too much about whether uh, our process for reconstructing the string can be done efficiently. Um, so um, whereas, um, Chin Ho's paper um, is more about that question. Um, otherwise, I think, so for us, um, like I said before, uh, because we're looking at circular strings, um, there is no like notion of beginning. So like the techniques like that they use um, 
it seems pretty hard to get them to apply to the circular case because one, we need to find the beginning first. So is there, you know, is there, you only have, you're gonna draw polynomially many samples. Um, and I guess you're saying there's not, there's not any hope of figuring out which sample came from which, or which traces come from which rotations. Like if you knew that, then, then you would be back in linear trace reconstruction, right? right? Yeah. But this is somehow too hard. Um, awesome. So I guess in terms of the deletion rate, when, in, when the deletion rate is constant and uh, all these recent papers, the tool they use is kind of different from the ones for low deletion rate. So the low deletion rates on uh, this alignment base where you draw some traces and then you align them to some points in X, but then uh, this const yeah, constant deletion rate, uh, the technique is more like, um, this polynomial method you are, where you prove some extremal bounds of some polynomial with bounded coefficients. So it's not, there's no really the notion of alignment in this technique. Got it, awesome. This is only for worst case. And I think in for our average case, there is, they use some alignment technique combined with this worst case approach. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Cam Musco, so who asks for circular trace reconstruction with like one over root n deletion probability. Uh, what's known versus the constant error regime? So if you do low error in the circular setting. Uh, so as far as I know, there is uh, nothing known about this yet. So this is not something that we put a lot of time into thinking about, um, but one would assume that you can get much better results than like e to the root of n. Um, and I have I have actually one more question about this uh, on trace reconstruction before we bring some other folks in. Um, this is more open ended. Do you do either of you think that there are um, models that would be interesting in between average case and and worst case? Yeah, so so in the upcoming so the, like in a few days I will talk about this uh, smooth analysis of trace reconstruction. Okay. So uh, this like an interpolation between the worst case and uh, average case. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And there we give an efficient algorithm for any constant perturbation of the worst case string. In the constant deletion rate regime. Yeah, for any constant deletion. Yes. That's right. So there's, there's been some discussion in the chat about um, depth robust graphs, but I actually wonder if we could bring some of it out here. So I think one thing that's being talked about are some questions about lower bounds maybe. Oh, actually that was something I wanted to know about from the talk. So could you give a sense of sort of what quantitatively the upper and lower bounds are on, on depth robustness and what you would hope for for various applications? Yeah, so there's a... Um kind of an, a known upper bound um, for on edge depth robustness. Um, kind of we looked at, uh, it's like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it matters about discussing the exact parameters, but. Uh, well, should um, we think of them as being linear in number of nodes or polynomial or I like no, just so, um, very rough things. It's like, if you can remove, you can remove, um, if, you, if you can remove um, the number of edges times I, or so, you, sorry. Let me. Just, um, you can have the depth of the graph by removing the number of nodes, so m divided by log n uh, edges. So there's a kind of a general, like known, a way to reduce the depth of the grass graph um, half by removing okay. uh, m over log n edges, and so that's kind of the upper bound. Um, and so we'd like to construct graphs that um, their depth robustness it matches that bound. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of talked about the um, pebbling complexity uh, relating to the pebbling complexity of data independent memory hard functions. Um, and what's been shown there is the um, 
Hebeling complexity is greater than or equal to E times D. So um, if you take a depth of bus graph and then you say label it using a hash function um, where like the label of each node is like, say you concatenate the labels of the parents and then hash it, um, that would give you a highly um, secure uh, memory hard function from a depth of bus graph. And so our construction gets closer to the bound than previous known constructions for certain values of the parameter where i isn't close to one or log n, but it doesn't actually quite achieve it. So that's what I was kind of talking about there. Awesome, thanks. The floor is open if others have questions for any authors. Um, let me ask a question of Joshua. Uh, can you give a sense of how you um, arrived at the sort of zoo of different updates and, and query types and whether they're kind of rules of thumb for what makes a combination of update and query easy, easy or hard? Like are there common structures between the easy ones and the hard ones? Sure. So uh, I don't know if there's any particular rule of thumb. Uh, to answer the first part of the question, uh, how we sort of arrived at, at this zoo or this set of updates and queries, we restricted our updates to um, just a, a particular set of, of updates, so like plus updates, max updates, and, and set updates, which sort of just replace the value of, of cells in some range. Uh, these sort of come from, the whole problem idea is sort of driven from Olympiad style problems where um, these are focused a lot in, in one dimension in sort of computing Olympiads and uh, not much is known in higher dimensions. So those sorts of operations commonly appear in those settings and that's why we sort of targeted um, this generalization. For uh, rules of thumb or intuition as to why some are hard and some are easy, uh, I think we've established that set updates uh, seem fairly doable in almost every case, even along with other updates um, in truly some quadratic time, but max updates intuitively seem to be a little bit harder. Um, they, this, the patterns they produce, you can produce um, sort of quadratically many different um, subregions, which um, gives rise to a bit of like hidden complexity, but we don't have anything hard on that other than when you com combine that with a couple of other updates, you can immediately get uh, reductions from say three sum or from um, orthogonal vectors, which, which mean they're, they're quite hard co as compared to the other convections. Thanks. Let me, let me, uh, maybe we can conclude the session with a question. Um, oh, I think something appeared in the chat. Awesome, a question from um, Cam Musco again. So one question I had about the sampling structures in parallel talk, do any of these gaps relate to computing eigenvalues in parallel or parallelization of other linear algebra primitives? So I think this is for Nathan. Um, I think um, I've been like all this work has kind of been done with like a lot of basic access to linear algebra operations already being doable in parallel. And I think the general gaps between sampling and counting um, are more just a product of the reductions being very inherently sequential than any sort of, um, I guess, limiting case of like what we can do in parallel from linear algebra primitives. But I also don't really know. So. Um, this is like a no with a big asterisk. I was also curious whether, um, are there any indications that there could be problems which, uh, you know, counting versus sampling problems which uh, are equivalent in the non, you know, in the, in, the, in the sequential setting, but actually do have different complexities in the parallel setting? Or do you think that everything should be, that it really should be equivalent, they should be equivalent in the parallel setting as well? I think they're a lot harder to do in parallel, but like being hard to do and proving that they're not doable are like, <laughs> so. Um. Certainly, I think, uh, 
a sentiment of hands in the air with lots of exciting things to explore is a great way to end the, the session. So um, we'll wrap up. There's a virtual coffee break right now. Let me remind all of you who are still here that there are long versions of all of these talks on YouTube. I watch them all, they're great. Um, and there are Slack channels for all of these papers if you want to discuss further with any of the authors. So thank you all for attending and I'll see you in the coffee break. Bye-bye.